Good morning, good morning, everybody, and welcome to, uh, I can't remember what I call my thing, Explorations, Life Explorations, The Art of Life Explorations with Angela Hardy. This morning we're doing something that is so much fun and so interesting because I have reached a stage of life. <laughs> and, you know, I wouldn't mind normally, but, boy, do I get hot sweats and discomfort with this damn stage of life. So the other day I met somebody called Louise and she, we were at Real Health um, recording together and she knows all sorts of things about a certain kind of a stage of life. And she knows all sorts of things about aging gracefully and about turning into the queen from the princess and all these wonderful things. And I said, girl, you're the one to talk to. So welcome to Louise. Um, here she is. Welcome, Louise. Thank you so much for joining us on the Art of Life Explorations this morning. Angela, it was so lovely to meet you the other day at the studio, and I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. It's going to be so much fun today. Speak to me a little bit about your journey. I'm always so interested in about how people came to do the kind of work they do. What is it you do, and how did you come to be here? So I started off pretty much you know, like a lot of people, young, healthy, always had blood sugar imbalances, but never anything to write home about, never any major health challenges or, or any um, anything sort of wrong with me. I had loads of energy. I used to dance. Life was good. And then when I entered my 30s, I wanted babies more than anything. That's all I wanted. My whole life, my parents fostered children. I used to babysit. I au paired for two years in Germany. So children were such a huge part of my, um, my upbringing and, and teenage and early adult years that that's all I wanted. Mm -hmm. And I found out that I was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome, a block fallopian tube and infertility. Mm -hmm. And every month... I would, you know, I'd menstruate and I would feel like a complete failure as a woman. It was really, really the hardest thing I've ever had to go through. And being diagnosed with something like polycystic ovarian syndrome was inextricably linked to the sugar imbalances that I had at, a, at you know, from a young age. And I didn't connect the dots because of the insulin resistance. I didn't connect the dots until much later on. But I had artificial insemination and things just really were, I was in a really rough place. And so my journey really started from there. I used to do some juicing before I thought I was healthy, but my journey towards myself really started from there. So what I started to do was I changed, I changed my life pretty much completely. I changed what I put in my body. So for me, it meant becoming vegetarian. And I never really liked uh, meat, so it was, it was that was an easy step for me. But removing the animal protein, the hormones that um, are in animals, I'm not saying it's for everybody, but that was my journey and that's what worked for me, really helped to, to catapult my journey. I changed. I also included a lot of uh, raw food, a lot of greens, green smoothies, green juices. I think a lot of people in South Africa know the, the company Soaring Free Superfood that did a two-day raw food course. So I just loaded my body with enzymes and nutrition. And then I changed what I put on my body. So I removed chemicals from my life as much as possible and switched to natural skincare, cleaning products, what I wash my clothes with, so as much as I could. I mean, we live in a chemical environment. When we drive, we're in traffic and it's carbon monoxide and all sorts of things. But I did the best that I could there. And then the third step, which I think was key in my journey, was I changed what I put in my mind because what you think about, you bring about. And I used a lot of Louise Hayes affirmations. Oh, dear, we've lost her. Well, I'm sure she'll be back in a moment. Let me just put myself here on this here screen. Are we here? Oh, you're back. Excellent. Sorry, you just went away for a moment. Oh, sorry. I must. Well, I was having a conversation with myself. I'm not sure what you where you got to. Well, I'm sure you're fascinating, darling. So no problem, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. So I changed. Did you hear about what I put in my yes. mind? Affirmations. Okay. Started to do Affirmations. Okay, that. perfect. So really start to learn the power of language and what you think about, you bring about, and how language shapes our bodies and how thoughts 
literally become matter, which turn into the cells of our bodies. And so instead of mm -hmm. saying, I have infertility, I have polycystic ovarian syndrome, I cannot have children, you know, to change that language just from I'm experiencing these challenges, you know, to, to changing that. So mm -hmm. what happened in the journey was I actually ended up um, divorcing my, at the time, husband and okay. my body healed yeah, yeah. And, it, and it was and I'm pretty sure that this whole journey had a, had a big part to play in it um, no. No. but there were you know there were other things and what happened was as I I kind of went on this journey he sort of stayed that stayed where he was and I sort of catapulted in a different direction on this beautiful journey of health and so what happened was my body healed itself. I went back to the gynae one year and he said to me, he did the little scan and he looked and he said to me, I don't know what you've done, but you don't need me anymore. You, you're, I don't know what you've done. And so my body healed itself. And I think, yeah, honey, I know beautiful. what I've done. I've I done know what I've like done. Savage, making this happen. <laughs> yes. And you know what the best thing was? The best thing was that it didn't feel like torture for me it didn't feel like I've got to get up now and make a green smoothie and I've got to eat healthy I still ate a lot of I still ate very differently to how I eat now but it was enough for my body to go oh okay this is this is useful like I can work with this yeah. and so yeah. yeah and so I think I have the building blocks to heal don't you you've got, got to have, have the building blocks you have to have the nutrients you have to have the minerals you've got to have the enzymes you've got to have available to your body what it needs to make yeah. the change. Yes. And I think these our bodies are these incredible beings and they just lean towards health and wholeness. They want to be whole. They want to heal. And we just got to remove the toxic load. And so that's what I did. I removed the toxic load from my mind, from my body, from, you know, what I put in my body and on my body, the chemicals that I was using through personal care, perfume, things like that. Mm. And, and, then it, and then something clicked. And I realized that there are other women in the world like me. And I'm pretty sure that I could learn and share and guide other women through a similar journey. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, I had studied beauty therapy. So I started off in beauty. And I studied at a holistic nutrition course, which just gave me a little bit of a foundation when it came to food. I did a, a beautiful eight-month NLP course. That he taught me about uh, you know our subjective experience of life so how you're experiencing this conversation is different to how I'm experiencing it because of our upbringings taught me a lot about language taught me a lot about you know how the mind works I thought that was really important to further my journey and, and possibly to when I start working with clients to, to understand them better and then I studied eating psychology coaching which is so incredible and eating psychology coaching says that what we eat is only half of the story, but who we are as eaters is the other half of the story. And I've got so much to say about that. It's such an Tell us a little more about what you mean by that. That sounds really an interesting mm. thing. Yeah. So mind-body nutrition says um, metabolism takes what we eat as well as our thoughts, our beliefs, our stress, our relaxation, everything, everything. Yes. And uses it to metabolize our foods. So pretty much you can eat the healthiest, most beautiful salad on earth. And if you eat it in a stress state, you have digestive shutdown. You have four times less oxygen output to the gut, 20,000 times less enzymatic output to the gut in a stress state. Um, you yeah, die of healthy gut bacteria. I mean, if you're running from that proverbial line, which is the stress response, your body's not you know, focusing on digestion. It is focusing on survival. We don't need digestion for survival. We need brain power. We need lungs, heart, legs, arms. And yeah. so we know that stress is a key part of our existence. You know, stress is, is important in, in daily life because we need short yeah. bursts of stress. But conversely, when our body's in a relaxation response around food, then we can digest food better. And so it's how we eat, who we are as eaters, are we a fast eater, moderate eater, slow eater, how we take in life and food and food and body issues, according to eating psychology, are gateways to something deeper. 
So we can change what we eat, but if we don't change that something, that little what happened to me when I was a kid or, you know, why I'm feeding myself or whatever the story is, if we don't get right to the nitty gritty, to the deeper, deeper aspect, I don't think we can fully heal. It is also the less easy work. Like no one really wants to go back and deal with all that stuff. It's much easier to <laughs> drink a green juice, you know, eat a salad. Um, and those are all sort of superficial things, I think. And so I found that I needed a little bit of something more. I am also that person that loves to study things, but I did need a little bit of something more just to yeah. round as I was working with women before getting to that deep, deep state and working on that something deeper. So functional mm -hmm. medicine coaching helped me a lot. I became a functional medicine coach and that is the food and lifestyle and sleep and the more practical aspects and it does delve into the something deeper but gives clients something to start with and so yeah so it just started to create like an all-round um, system or package so that I could continue to heal myself and live an ageless life and so that other woman could too, did yoga teacher and face yoga teacher. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> the face yoga. I see it pops up all the time on my YouTube. Like, watch that oh, face yoga. Yes. How old am I? Do you guys know how old I am? They're like, yep, we know. Face yoga for you, my girl. <laughs> yep, face yoga for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm really interested in this expression that you use, this ageless aging, because you're not a person who's talking about looking young, Botox, facelift, you know what I mean? All of that, get in the magazines and wipe out the lines and make you look like you're 20 again. This is not what you're about. You're about aging in a graceful, beautiful, but also looking vibrant, staying staying gorgeous as you age. Feeling vibrant. Talk about that a little bit. <laughs> okay. So, you know, so I'm 47 and I've never had chemical peels or Botox. So I decided to go the natural route. And I also want to stay looking and feeling youthful. I mean, don't we all? Yeah. And in my journey, I started to realize that as women, we receive over 3,000 messages a day, up to 3,000 messages a day of how we should mm -hmm. look, feel, act, and be. Mm -hmm. And we are, not we, but uh, media is glorifying youth glorifying a 16 year old model who is promoting anti-aging skincare products say or you know whatever the story and she is. doesn't look like that and she doesn't look like that so therefore we need to and, and she doesn't so so oh, that's the other thing even that. the model for airbrush completely yeah bigger eyes so, longer neck tuck the chin yeah. it's yeah. shocking really it's shocking. when you see what they're up to with these models they don't even look like themselves so how can like we well. ever achieve that? Yeah, it, we can't. And That's so, true. of course, if media said you were beautiful just the way you are, no one would ever sell anything. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they won't. They'll, they'll oh, yeah, that but there is a little bit of a revolution coming, I think, with people, yeah. with women starting to accept and love themselves. If you look at my DNA, my DNA says that I'm, my skin DNA, I'm prone to premature lines and wrinkles and um, my vitamin c gene is deleted and you know um we need vitamin c for collagen and i think that 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 information i think anyone who does have dna tests not and that's not for everybody it's for people who can take it as information and do something about it not for not for someone who may so that, that is the destiny, like, oh, I'm going to age prematurely, sorry for me, and, and, and mm. do nothing about it. But for me, it was, it was so interesting because I learned, okay, this, this is something that, that is information that I can use and I can act differently. Mm. And so I don't have to listen to what the media says, so not just the DNA, not just the, the tests and that, but... I can use natural products which are removing the chemical load. I can use local wherever possible. They're beautiful, active skincare and home care and hair care ranges in South Africa. I can support small businesses and I can live this beautiful, ageless life. And what does that mean? That age, living agelessly to me means embracing who I am, 
while I'm also doing the work. It doesn't mean I embrace who I am and this is it and I'm just going to let myself go. Always looking to do the work. But in the meantime, while I'm doing the work, to learn to love the parts of myself that are flabby and to, to realize that I am going to get lines, I am going to get wrinkles, I am um, going to age. How do I age with a healthy mind and a healthy body and a whole healthy spirit? So, mm-hmm. yeah, so ageless living to me is um, living, living a life through, and, and you'll see like the way I, I sort of separate things in my practice is living agelessly through balanced hormones, ageless beauty strategies, and a nourished body, because I think they're all connected. Well, I mean, I, I think that when we reach our age, I'm, I just turned 50 this year. So when we reach our age, wow. yeah, it's good lighting. I've got this ring light. Make sure you <laughs> love lighting. <laughs> light in front of me all the time. I'd be so happy. <laughs> but I do. I find it what the most interesting thing about this age is not just my own journey where I'm starting to hit menopause and get hot flushes, and you know, mm-hmm. it's this mm-hmm. constant thing with working with dry skin and blah 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 and all the stuff and the wrinkly and this. The, the crinkly stuff that goes with it, which is interesting enough in its own right. But yes. when you're at this age, your parents are now hitting their last 10 years, yeah. at, unless they're already dead, you know what I mean? And we start to see things that really, for me, feel quite scary in their lives. Mm-hmm. The, the the incapacity to walk properly because they've lost their postural alignment and they've lost muscle mass and they don't have tone and and how tired they become and do you know what I mean? It's like and they struggle with that just the ever increasing struggle with the gut and how that seems to just whack them and and it's so interesting. I mean specifically for me I see the difference between my mother who is um well, shame if she's listening. She's 84. No, she, <laughs> my mother is 80. I think she's 84 or something around about that year. And my mother-in-law, who's still in her 70s, and my mother has had a knee replacement operation, and she has a lot of pain in her knee, but she is mentally so strong. She's just so willing. She's so active. She's so engaged in life. And how she comes across so engaged and so involved, and she, you say, how's your knee? And she's like, ah. We're going to talk about that. And she carries on. And, oh, wow. and my mother-in-law, who struggled and struggled with her gut, and now she's had this really bad run when she's in and out of hospital, and now she's on a walker, and she's, you know, probably a good seven, eight years younger than my mom. And so there's this balance between, like, you age, and you hit a bad stroke of luck, and you have a health problem, and it's just like, <sighs> when you're that age, and how scary it is to watch them go downhill and to see that it's like, if you think it was hard to heal your body when you were 20 or 30, how hard it is for them to make a comeback when they're 70 and 75. And how I'm looking forward to this and I'm saying, I don't want to have a knee replacement operation. So every day I have to take care of my nutritional load so my body can heal itself. And I've got to take care of my posture so that I'm properly aligned, that I'm not wearing myself in a way that doesn't allow me to be strong and to stay fit and to not have injuries and do you know what I mean I've got to eat well and I've got to be careful about what I'm drinking and I've got to because I don't want to have that in my last 10 years of life and I don't know if it's even avoidable but I do know that if I'm not looking after it now it's going to be way too late then Mm -hmm. so that's our age of that also we're seeing that as well as looking after what's going on now yeah so it's it, that's such a, a huge topic because if you look at Mark Hyman, I absolutely love Mark Hyman. I follow him. He's now, I think, mid-60s or early 60s, and he says he's in better shape than he was 10 years ago. He started doing resist weight, like weight training, some resistance training and exercise, and he never enjoyed exercise before. And coming from someone when I was younger, I danced, but I've never loved exercise. I've never really mm. loved exercise. I didn't come from an athletic family You know, I've always got to put it somewhere at the moment. um, I've got a treadmill behind me and I've actually, the only way for me to use it is I've stuck little little hooks on it so my iPad can go in it so I can watch a a series and I can (laughs) (laughs) use the treadmill and watch a series. Otherwise, it's the most boring thing for me. 
Um, so depending on like our upbringing, the way we are, you know, everybody is different. Um, we can encounter those things as we age and it's really not fun. And mm. so I think again, exactly what you're saying, you, you touched all, on all the topics to, to eat well, you know, to keep our body alkaline inside so that our joints and our, our system, our gut can thrive mm. and to move to move just a little bit, you know, to just keep active at the moment. I don't know about you, but since lockdown, most of my uh, clients are now online. And so I sit and I sit and I sit and i got to remember, get up, move every hour, get up, move at least two to five minutes, ideally 10 minutes, go to the loo, make a drink, walk around, like, you know, just get jump on the rebounder, like anything, just move bodies because they say sitting is the new smoking. So I think that just... Like the easiest thing that we can do like today doesn't cost anything to get up at least every hour and move a little bit, keep the blood flowing. Therefore, we get fresh oxygen to the cells and blood flow, yeah. um, which collagen's uh, main nutrient comes from blood. So not just in the in the skin, you know, but in our bodies, we need we need that to have healthy joints, healthy bones. So, yeah, it's such a it's such a tricky Topic to and to see, like you say, our parents and older generations suffering. I think that we have so much more information now. We have power. That being mm-hmm. said, just because it sounds simple doesn't mean it's easy. And so, you know, really for myself, what I found, and um, there's a there's a couple of people who lead who lead this sort of drive to small slow steps. I call it small slow steps. Mm-hmm. Is Making a tiny, tiny change, like something that is so small that is doable, and then building mm-hmm. on that. And then Cleo um, popularized it in his book, Atomic Habits. And it's like, what do I want to do? Okay, I want to meditate every day, mm-hmm. as an example. Okay, well, how am I going to start meditating? Because it's boring and the thoughts keep coming through my mind and I can't keep quiet. And in this busy time, how- so what do I do? I'm going to meditate one minute every day and I'm going to attach it to something I do well. So I go down in the morning and I drink my, my bottle of warm water. Straight after that, I meditate for one minute. I sit on the couch for one minute and meditate and I make it so small that it's doable. And then maybe one day it turns to two minutes or three minutes or five minutes. And so like I'm like me with the treadmill, just so I can walk and it's a really fast walk. I, I, I'm not really a runner, but that I can move my body and just get the heart racing um i do go out but when i'm here and doing that i've got to make it attractive if i don't have the series yeah. on spending an hour on the treadmill is not going to happen or spending 20 minutes yeah. is not going to happen i start to feel clammy and it's not fun it's boring yeah. and i've just got to like nothing's holding me there but if i'm watching an episode that's one hour i will i will do that and so just making just making things doable and i find with women we like we had it all or nothing. I must eat everything healthy. Right. I must change my whole life. I'm going to not eat carbs anymore. I'm going to, you know, and <laughs> it's I not think that's realistic. Probably the biggest problem with changing something is that idea that you have to get it right, that it's got to be perfect. And actually, just the tiniest little thing that you do is better than nothing. And so keep doing tiny ah. things. Yeah. I've always said to my whole philosophy about food especially is yep. there's actually a lot of really healthy snacks. There's a lot of healthy things to eat. There's a lot of healthy lunches. There's a lot of stuff that you can eat that actually you can enjoy. The fear of deprivation is what stops. Mm-hmm. It's yes. what stops people from doing well, you know, eating well, taking care of their own diets. It's a fear of deprivation. It's like, well, if you're going to tell me, not me, I don't care. But if you're going to tell somebody, <laughs> don't drink any coffee, you know what I mean, don't eat anything with sugar in it, don't, and that's what their lifestyle is, that's like, that's too much. I can't. Too much. And I yeah. always say to, to people, well, I'll tell you what, add something to your diet. Don't take anything away. Don't worry yeah. about taking anything away. Just yeah. add something really healthy to your diet. And then add two really healthy things, and then add three really healthy things. And by the time I'm eating three healthy things, I'm actually not craving some of those that's unhealthy it. things that I used to eat. So it's not like you don't have to take anything away. Just start adding. Now, that's something anybody can do. You know what I mean? Anybody can add something to their diet. Yeah, absolutely. Just eat more of something and you're just like, okay, well, I just ate some healthy snack. I really don't feel like cheesecake right now. Like, well, 
wow, okay, who knew that you could not feel like cheesecake? Imagine that. I'm <laughs> <laughs> full, I had something nice, I'm full, I'm feeling satisfied, there's no craving, there's no blood sugar imbalance. I don't feel like that thing. Totally. And that, I find, for me, is the, the very, very best way of managing food, of managing diet, of, of taking care of eating well, yes. is to look for good, healthy stuff to eat and add that stuff and never, never say to myself, you're not allowed this. I just don't feel like it once I've eaten enough good stuff. Yeah, especially this year, we're, not, we're deprived of connection, we're deprived yeah. of going out, we're deprived of our favourite restaurants where we were for a long time. Um, you know, we can't see each other in person, have our dinner clubs. We, we're deprived of so, we feel deprived of so much. Now, now you're going to take away my coffee. I mean, I don't drink coffee, but whatever it is, you're going to take away my whatever. And um, um, most women would have to like, sorry, I'm going to have to wring your neck and send you down the river. I can't do that. <laughs> exactly. Don't need alcoholics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's absolutely it. So, Adding and you know, hunger is the body looking for minerals, and so you know that that feeling like okay, have a piece of chocolate, mm, chips, and biscuits, and mm. just chomping, chomping, munching, munching. But there's something missing. I can't quite get that. So mm. firstly, there's always an emotional aspect. We are emotional eaters. When we were born, we opened our mouth to cry. And we got given the breast, the bottle, the dummy, the teething biscuit. The mm. so we are trained that like food equals comfort. So that's normal we are all emotional eaters but also to um i lost my train of thought <laughs> i was listening anyway. to and i lost it as I well know. yeah <laughs> well, so the end, really. we're just talking about oh, hunger is, yeah so yeah. hunger hunger is the body looking for for minerals right, so yes. when you when you're adding all those healthy things and you've kind of got mm. that mineral and you feel satiated then you don't need to scrounge around between the chips and the chocolate and the pizza and the, like what is it that I'm looking for because you get it and so like an easy substitution like salt and fat okay olives doesn't have to be crisps you know or you want the crunchy from crisps find something that's crunchy that gives you that satisfaction mm -hmm. so like there are the easy swaps and like you say just add the good stuff and find joy mm -hmm. so one thing in eating psychology is someone is looking for sweetness and they're craving sweetness like where else can you find sweetness in your life? Like what what brings you joy? Is it yeah. something so simple like playing with my dog on my bed brings mm -hmm. joy and I find sweetness in my life. And so, you know, everything's connected. It's not just about, yeah. we're not separate, like what we eat and how we feel and all the different things, everything is connected. And it's such a beautiful life, you know, and such a beautiful mm -hmm. journey. If we can learn just to embrace it and be okay. Be okay with where we are. Be okay with our ourselves. Yeah. You know, and I think also we need more than anything else to learn to listen to our bodies. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like I often think I'm listening to my body and I'm thinking, you know, I need there's an like this oral <laughs> fixation going on. Mm. And then when I really pay attention, I realize actually I'm just thirsty. So I'm looking for something, like something salty or something sweet or something that's actually going to just make the saliva run because I'm thirsty. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, if I'm really properly paying attention and paying attention often enough that I can decipher the message because if I think I'm paying attention and I'm craving something, actually if yeah. I'm really learning to decipher that message quite often, I'll recognize that message the next time as I'm thirsty. I need some water. Exactly. That's actually yeah. what I need. Yeah. So amazing. Learning or I'm how bored, to... or I'm upset, or you know. Also, if you don't mind, I've got a really good story about this that could Go be really useful for people. Yeah. When I was in my twenties, I used to have terrible headaches from actually from late high school. I used to get these terrible yeah. headaches, and I had no idea what was going on. And I I didn't know if I had sensitivities or I had uh, allergies or if it was my environment or if it was my eyes or what was going on and it turned out that actually I had a blood sugar problem. So um, when I discovered I had a blood sugar problem, I started to carry around what we call emergency rations. <laughs> my husband was like, you got emergency rations, right? Season for me in my handbag. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know those, that hangry feeling? Okay, if you get hangry, you need to carry around emergency rations. Yeah. And so you don't always feel hungry at the mm. time when your blood sugar is mm. dropping, 
but there are signs and for me it was a very very simple and easy tell because i'd start to get a headache right at the back of my head wow. and i would start to feel a little bit shivery inside and um if i left it too long i'd feel very irritable so i i could tell my blood sugar is dropping so i started carrying around these snacks and then i would when my blood sugar dropped and i was starting to feel a headache i knew i had to eat okay so cool a few years later translate this into every time i get this start of a headache or every time i have a headache i know i need to eat and so i start eating every time i have a headache drink too much red wine mm -hmm. have a hangover the next day spend the whole day being so hungry so hungry and thinking to myself why am i i can't possibly be still hungry i mean i know how much i need to eat to satisfy yeah how can i be so hungry and then i clicked that i'd actually trained my body to be hungry when i had a headache Pavlovian and so, moment. Yeah, it was quite an awakening for me to realize that you can you can literally train yourself to feel hungry when you're stressed, when there's something going on. If you're using food as a countermeasure to something, if you are stress eating, if you're sad eating, if you're whatever eating to soothe something, you can actually teach your body to be literally hungry. And this is where it's very interesting to see people come and say, but I'm hungry. And you're like, are you? <laughs> are you? What are you but actually for? you are. Yes. Because your brain is screaming and saying, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. But actually, you've actually just trained yourself for hunger. Now you've got to untrain that because mm. it's not hunger. It's looking for this thing. And it was really interesting for me to discover that. Wow. This is a hangover. This ain't no blood sugar problem, baby. And you're not actually hungry. So, so how did you sort that out? Well, awareness is everything, isn't it? Yeah, you know I mean? awareness like, and then curiosity. Yeah. yeah, so I just became aware. Look, it's not like I used to get a hangover every day, so it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't a problem Thank for me. <laughs> <laughs> I just am aware that blood sugar drop is not an yeah. indicator that I don't have enough food, but I do yeah. have to solve it with food. And yeah. so for me, I have to be very mindful of eating low GI and low GL. And... Mm -hmm. Because I'm very aware of the fact that if I don't eat properly in that way, I'm going to have a bloody great headache and that is intolerable and it's hours and hours and hours and hours till it goes away. I'm very, very cautious about how much, how much I'm feeding this constant level of just a nice low level of glucose energy delicately, carefully, constantly. So I am a grazer. It works for me. It's not for everybody. Okay. Yep. But I'm a grazer. I eat almost without fail just about every two and a half or three hours. I know that I need to eat. I have a small portion of good low GI or GL food, and it works for me. That's incredible. And how blessed are you? I mean, you did the work and you found what works for you. I looked for 15 mm -hmm. years, Louise. 15 years I suffered it's from a long journey. daily. Yeah, it was a right. long journey. <laughs> I couldn't and imagine. And you know where I found it? You begin Fair to imagine. lady. Oh, no. Fair lady, one little thing, a snippet that said, if you tend to suffer from headaches, consider you might have blood sugar problems, eat something. That's how I found it. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. That's incredible. You have to look. You have to keep seeking. It, it, I don't know. I mean, I was lucky to find it because I looked for a hell of a long time to try and figure it out. Yeah, very lucky to find it. You know, and where my blood sugar imbalances, I would almost... I would have blood sugar drops in the morning and I'd almost faint in the shower. People have had it no, would know, like you feel like either you're going to throw up or faint, whichever one comes first. And I shout to my mom and she'd come running in with a glass of milk and so I could just quickly get something in my stomach. I wasn't a way to live. And before I went to au pair overseas, my mom was like, well, you can't go around carrying like cheese and biscuits in your handbag. Watch <laughs> me. <laughs> so I saw a dietitian. She said, Think controllable with diet, and I learned that. And look, in my twenties, I still was not, you know, it was still just about eating whatever I wanted and drinking, and you know, out all night and that kind of thing. So it's not that I, that that it was life changing then, but uh, that thought process led me towards to where I am now. And you were saying grazing works well for you, so mm -hmm. mine is. I healed my leptin and my insulin levels by not grazing and by not snacking. Um, and, and that has worked for me. So I, 
I'll have something um, in the morning. It's a cacao smoothie, loads of greens and superfoods and things. And I can go for four to six hours, which is completely different place to where I was, say, 20 years ago. And so isn't it beautiful how the our bodies are so different? And I guess part of what you and I do is is finding out what what is my what is what works for me what works for you what works you know everyone is so different and it's such a special journey and then that being said as a woman sort of enters into perimenopause Mm -hmm. so many things happen and we find that sugar caffeine alcohol things that we could have before they've always been powerful substances I think they always need to be respected, but especially at this time in our lives, they can become endocrine disruptors at any age, but especially in a perimenopausal, menopausal age. Wine or alcohol is directly related to estrogen levels, um, you know, the the sugars to our insulin, to our leptin, you know, the muffin top. (laughs) And that's the hunger, say, satiation kind of um, experience. Caffeine, I believe if these substances were discovered now, they'd probably be um, scheduled. <laughs> they'd, be, they'd be scheduled. Like, I need a script, please. I need some 85% chocolate. Sure, you can have yeah. it. <laughs> 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 Three days fly, no more. Yeah. And so, and so, you know, journeying through, you mentioned earlier about experimentation. I think that, like, life is just one big experiment what worked for me five years ago is not working for me now what works for me now is not going to work for me in five years from now so it's understanding that I don't think there's one right diet that's perfect for everyone and I don't believe there's one right diet that's perfect for me for my whole life right so the and when I say diet it's just me way of eating you know yeah so what I'm doing now is working for me now and when I find that I'm less than sort of as healthy as I as I have felt recently, if I feel like something's changing, I need to just be a little bit more adaptive to going, okay, so X was working for me, but X isn't working for me anymore. Change that. What else can I eat? You know, whatever the story is. And so as we go through life, our hormones are fluctuating. Everything is changing. I mean, you know, our lives at 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 a woman of a certain age at midlife. I don't think it's midlife because I mean, I'm going to be 120, <laughs> and I want to live till I die. So, you know, I don't want to be obsessive about it. I want to enjoy it. I want to, um, you know, you spoke of earlier, um, right right at the introduction about princess to queen. I want to embrace my queen. And step in and like rule my queendom and just have a rich, juicy life, whatever that means today. And in five years, whatever that means in five years. And so it's this continuous journey and it doesn't have to be daunting. It doesn't have to be a big deal. It doesn't have to be work. It can be, I mean, there's always work involved in change, right? I mean, no one loves change, all change. (laughs) However, if we're ready for those small changes, the small changes leads to the next one, which leads to the next one. And next thing, we're, we're on this path to mm. just joyous life, you know, and as you mentioned, awareness, 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 just of where we are. And what do I want instead? You know, what do I want yes. instead? Yeah. Mm. It's, to me, it is the thing is that you, my husband always says, you're a bubbling chemistry experiment. And that is absolutely true. And I mean, they yeah. obviously they've done a lot of research about what is the, the chemical soup in which your cells are sitting. Yeah. And then what are you adding in nutrients and what are you adding in? Yeah. And so the chemical soup is all of your thoughts and all of your emotions and that and all of what's going on toxically and chemically and whatever yeah. around you. Into, and then it's your nutrition. That, what are you adding to that chemical soup to make it more nutritious or less nutritious or whatever the case may be? And we are, we're a bubbling chemistry experiment. And yeah. We have to take responsibility for our own yeah. chemistry experiment. It's and time. Yeah. yeah, and I, I mean, it's some people think that that is hard and it doesn't seem like fun to them. For me, I think it's quite fun. I mean, I think it's a pretty cool adventure to be and responsible for myself and to play around with what it is that makes me feel well or good or whatever the case may be. And the truth of the matter is that I can't know everything. And I can't do it yeah. myself always. 
sometimes I need to find somebody and say, what is this DNA analysis thing? This sounds very interesting. Can you help me with this? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because maybe yeah. there's something yeah. going on for me that I need to be looking at more strongly or put my attention on. It is a frust- food in particular is a very frustrating pitfall of a journey of it's just like honestly you read one article it's like don't eat this you read the other article it says you eat this and the next this one's saying oh yeah no i'm vegetarian and vegan it works like a bomb it's amazing the other person's saying oh geez i just stopped being a vegan because i couldn't get the protein and it's like oh la, 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 la. you know it's, you just, it's too much oh, hey it's too much um, we're bombarded we're yeah. bombarded and so for us to solve the problem ourselves is sometimes not so easy either, mm-hmm. even while we are taking responsibility. And it does help yeah. to have somebody else to help us along and say to us, look, this is what I'm seeing in your genetic testing. This is what I'm seeing in your blood results. And by the way, you're now perimenopausal. And did you know that this is what's happening with your hormones now? Yeah, because you don't know if you're not s- struggling with this. You have no idea what's going to happen. Well, that's the thing. And, and exact, you know, you we keep bringing it up. It's that awareness again and curiosity. Curiosity, you know, the curiosity is so important. And, um, willingness. Take, and willingness. Take whatever it takes to do whatever it takes to do the best for yourself. And in a way, what that actually comes down to, which I find interesting, because because of this idea that it's all about deprivation, people think that it's a punishment to look after yourself. Yes. But it's a self-love. Do you know what I mean? It's like when you love yourself, when you want when you're gentle with yourself and you're kind to yourself and you want to look after yourself and you want to live the best life in a way that is loving and supportive and kind, then it doesn't feel like a deprivation. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't feed your children coffee and candy all day long because you love them and you want to look after them. You know what exactly. I mean? So yeah. Same applies, baby. Take care of yourself in the same way you think it's proper to take care of your kids and, and do the best you can for yourself, if you will, you know? It's so interesting as women that women, we care for everyone else first and then and then if there's any care left, it's for us. And I spoke to someone once and they said they can't love themselves and we had a whole conversation about it. And there was, you know, a whole lifetime of, of self-loathing, of worthlessness, and it happens a lot, you know, but because we get all these messages that we're not good enough all day from from surrounding, from media. Mm. And they came up with something that I use all the time now. It was like, wow, this is so wise. They said, I'm willing to love myself. And just that, just saying, I am willing to love myself mm. because you know, we say to people, oh, you know, you must love yourself, everything will be better, or you must be kind oh, to yourself. Yeah. I'm willing to be kind to myself. I'm willing to love myself. There's like a whole shift that happens here. Being yeah. willing yeah. to do that suddenly opens something up. It's like the heart cracks open just a little bit, you know, and 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 lets the light in and lets a little bit of warmth in. And perhaps in time, we can be more than willing to love ourselves or to accept certain aspects, we can actually start to embrace and to love ourselves. It's quite, it's, yeah. Well, this is quite actually quite beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, this is my field. This is what I do is I teach people to love themselves unconditionally, to have confidence, to have yeah. self-worth, to have a sense of self-esteem, to get that good feeling. And I would go just one step further and say, are you willing to give yourself permission because yes. for me, permission is the big word. It's like I'm, mm-hmm. I'm allowed to love myself without yeah. having to be more. I'm allowed to love myself without having to do more. I'm allowed to love myself exactly as I am, even when I feel like a complete loser, even when I'm a lunatic, even when I fail, even when I'm getting old, even when I've got wrinkles, even when. doesn't matter. I give myself to love myself permission to love myself in mm-hmm. For me, that's the big word. It's like when I use, when I found that word for myself, it's like, Oh, I can just allow myself, give myself permission to do it. I love that. And then the willingness comes after that. It's like, and then I'm willing to do everything it takes to do that. It's like, yeah. When I have bad thoughts and feelings, I'm willing to look at those and say, no, thank you very much. And when I, when I don't take care of myself, I'm willing to look at that and say, how can I do better? Mm-hmm. You know. 
Yeah, so, that small step, that one little thing. How can I do just that one little thing today? Doesn't have to be everything, just one yeah, thing. Yeah, and also it doesn't set us up for that, hey? It doesn't set us up for self love. It, it actually, it we keep getting taught that self love um, is, it's. Um, Candlelit bars. <laughs> <laughs> True. It's arrogant and it's, um, you're not, um, um, you know, we keep getting taught that. We talk that. The people who love themselves are vain and they're selfish. And it's the furthest thing from what unconditional self-love actually is. Yeah. Unconditional self-love is actually gentleness and it's compassion. And that overflows out Absolutely. of your life. You don't become more arrogant. You don't become more vain. You become less of all of that, actually, because you give yourself permission to be okay with yourself, even though you're, you know, you're not perfect. We become, so, we become you. You become you, and then it's like, wow, actually being me is quite easy. This is quite a win. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's so hard to drive I'm yourself okay. Away. I'm actually okay. okay. You, this yeah. is easy. I like this. So the first time I met you, we spoke about. <laughs> yes. We spoke about. Um, I don't know. You were coming out the door, and you were talking about the wrinkles on the face, and I, we were having this big fat laugh about how I was sleeping on my pillow, and it was this side. Oh my god! I to keep waking up in the morning with this Sleep line. Right Yes. engaged like directly and then you was like oh and i know how to solve this talk about that for us to finish off because that was so like okay cool there's some actually practical things you can do to not be so wrinkly on your face when you wake up in the morning and i thought that was pretty cool yeah so sleep wrinkles when you lie on a pillow you yeah. get compression and you also get wrinkles from as you sliding along right yeah. and so sleep wrinkles are the lines that form here here, 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 and the overhanging lid. It's not, you know, it's not just because suddenly you have all this excess skin. It's years of compressing your face like that. You can see how it wants to just um, sort of droop. Yeah. And so those are sleep lines. They're vertical lines. They also happen on the chest. Yeah. So when you look up things like that, people will say, well, just sleep on your back. Just, just sleep yeah. on your back then you don't have sleep wrinkles but something called glymphatic drainage which is the shampooing of your brain it removes the amyloid plaques from your brain while you sleep actually one of my real health episodes is on this because that's how we that's how we got talking about this i think it's next week maybe and so sleeping on my back is not an option for me i mean i, I do sleep on my back sometimes but i'm a side sleeper when i do facials i can immediately see who's a flat side sleeper who's a back sleeper mm -hmm. and it's like Vertical lines, brain health into old age. Hmm, it's tricky because we don't want the vertical yeah. lines, but we don't want the brain health. Well, I've so, had lines in Alzheimer's, that's for sure. That's for sure, yeah. yeah. So easy, practical ways to start to change and to reduce sleep wrinkles. Because at the beginning, they just you wake up and your face is creased. And after a decade, the crease just doesn't go away. <laughs> Those lines just stay. And um, we're going to get them. Like, you know, we're going to get a line. And for me, like if the rest of my skin texture and that is, is good and I've, and I've done my face yoga and I'm looking after myself, a line is not the end of the world. And if I can delay those lines, even better. So change your pillow. Sleep on a harder pillow. Because think about that soft pillow that's like all squishy, right? So that's not oh, ideal. Nice. I'm actually about um, a sleep. Hello. Okay. So I'll let you know um, the results on that one. Um, ideally, a silk pillowcase or satin pillowcase. Silk is amazing because it biodegrades. It's a natural um, product, but mm -hmm. something because it's, and it's also really hydrating for skin and hair. And so life changing. I, I changed my pillow and my pillowcase this year, and my sleep wrinkles, and I am doing all the exercises and everything else. But I'm telling you what, it's made a difference. Just those really? two things. Yep. Wow. And then, you know, if, if someone is getting a lot of lines on the around the eyes, a, a beautiful silk mask, because then we're not crushing our eyes so much, the, the mask is, is against the pillow. And then, so it's, again, awareness. Everything's about awareness. So those mm -hmm. are three small little things that you can do that are super practical. I would say don't change too much what, what how you sleep. Although what I changed was when I sleep on my side, I don't sleep like this anymore. So I don't like crush everything up. Oh, I'm nice. up on, sort of down my side. Yeah. So that chest is still open. You get things like 
to be bras which like hold your breasts apart while you're sleeping. I'm like, really? No, that's just taking it one step too far. For me. <laughs> and, and so, and so, yeah. So that's a little bit, a, a few little tips. It's such a fascinating topic, you know. There's this lines and wrinkles, and everyone wants to erase them. But you know, instead of let's getting all aggro about them, let's just look at what are the small things that we can do mm. to minimize mm. lines and wrinkles and what are the things that we can do to improve our skin health from inside from outside how we apply our products don't just like slap them on and expect them to be like magic you know how do you apply are you massaging are you bringing fresh oxygen and blood to the area are you draining the lymph all of these things are going to help you to reduce your wrinkles because collagen needs fresh blood collagen you know we want to toxins sitting in the lymph where oxygen and fresh blood should be living so we want to keep the flow so I said no flow no glow so you know just all those simple little things and all it takes is maybe five minutes a day buy yourself a little egg timer you know the egg timer with the uh, with the sand three or five minute egg timer and apply your products turn it upside down and massage your face give your face some love just you know if you know any face exercises perform bones and it's like what we do every day counts for more than what we do once in a while. So it's just those small little things again. Yeah. Mm. And you know what else I was just thinking as you were talking about this is that what's so interesting also is that as I age and I become an older woman and you can see that I'm an older woman, people take me more seriously. Ha, and you see. I was, it's not necessarily a bad thing, you know. So I was, oh, doing, this, um, I was doing this thing called Angel Circle where – it was free coaching and people would come online and do, and there was a woman who used to come regularly online. And then the one time she came a little bit early and the two of us were chatting and she was saying, yeah, you know, um, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, well, I'm 50 this year. And she was, what? And I said to her, yeah, no, I'm 50 this year. And she said to me, but you look 30. I'm like, yeah, no, it's my good light. She said, you know what? <laughs> she said to me, you know what? She said, I've been sitting here thinking that it's all very well all the stuff that you're telling me, which is useful and amazing and wonderful, but you couldn't, you, possibly understand, right? <laughs> you couldn't possibly understand my experience because I'm 30 years older than you. And so I can't necessarily relate. And I was like, the moment I knew you were 50, she said, in that moment, suddenly I was thinking, this chick knows what the hell she's talking about. <laughs> you see. And yeah. she can relate to me and what she's talking about is about me. And now I suddenly am more engaged in this experience of like, she knows what she's doing. And so for me, I was just thinking, well, you know, wrinkle it too is not a bad thing. And looking a little bit more my age, not a bad thing because the truth of the matter is there is a certain wisdom that comes from age. You've had a life experience, you've worked hard, you've studied hard, you've experienced hard. And you've come to this place in your life where you know what the hell you're talking about. Yep. And you're only going to know more as you get older. So there's a certain amount of respect that is garnered through the wrinkles in my face. And when you see my age, you know that I know stuff. And I thought that was like, okay, well, then I can respect these wrinkles too, right? I can I can respect Absolutely. the fact that I look more my age. And, and I don't do need to fight against that. Yep. No fighting. Yeah. Acceptance, love. It's It's the only way. Yeah. And I know, we, and, <laughs> and I don't know how to be the wise woman. Sorry, sorry, yeah. interrupted you twice. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. Um, and I know that you are, you know, managing the time, but I, I don't know if I have time to add like one small thing about wisdom. Go for it. So in the ancient times, women, and even now, women who become oh, this was going to be so good, and now we've lost her. Let's just give it a moment and see if Louise comes back. Oh dear. All right. Well, if she pops in, we will um, hear the rest of the story. But if she doesn't, let me just show you quickly at the bottom of the screen. This is my email address and Louise's email address. So if you are looking for some of the wonderful wisdom that Louise has about aging gracefully, and that means garnering the, the wisdom of looking after yourself in terms of your diet, in terms of um, what genetically you need to be doing, in terms of how to get the wisdom of the mind and getting that stuff right and helping yourself just to be well in terms of how you're growing up into your 
later life or even into your midlife. And so if you're suffering from anything that you're really struggling with in your body and um, looking to look for diet and, and health and um, an idea of how to look after that, Louise is your gal. And if you are looking to learn to love yourself and to have self-esteem and self-worth and to find your way through to finding that good feeling inside, that's me. So you can have a look at Louise's email address below and mine below as well. And if you're looking for more information, you can have a look at our websites, which are the same as the email address, but obviously with www in front. Um, I will ask Louise to put all of her information in the Facebook feed below. You'll find all of my stuff, all of my free stuff, all of the YouTube videos that I've got available. I've got hundreds of them available. Anything that you're looking for, that you're looking for a little bit more free information, a little bit more how can you get more out of us without even talking to us, that will be below in the feed as well. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a sweet pleasure having this interview with Louise. I'm sorry we lost her at the end, but you can connect with her directly. Have a wonderful day. Got to push two buttons.